we have now encountered two types of integrals. The indefinite integral, here written as the integral of f of t dt, and the definite integral, here written as the integral from a to b of f of t dt. Although we write the integrals in similar ways, the two integrals are quite different objects. The indefinite integral is the solution, big F of t, to the pure time differential equation, df dt equals little f of t, to which we have to add an arbitrary constant. This undetermined constant is why we use the term indefinite. The definite integral, on the other hand, is the total change from time t equals a until time t equals b, when the rate of change is given by the function little f of t. The integrals are defined in quite different ways. The indefinite integral is defined in terms of an antiderivative. The derivative of big F is little f. To get big F from little f, we have to undo the differentiation. The definite integral, on the other hand, is defined in terms of a limit of Riemann sums. We chop up the interval, a to b, into small subintervals to estimate the total change in that interval, then take the limit as the number of subintervals goes to infinity. Moreover, when we evaluate the integrals, we get two quite different objects. The indefinite integral gives us a function. Actually, it gives us a whole family of functions, because we have the arbitrary constant c, which can take on any value. The definite integral, on the other hand, simply gives us a number. What is the total change from a to b? The definite integral spits out the single number, telling us what that total change is. Especially from the definitions, in terms of an antiderivative versus a Riemann sum, it's hard to see how the integrals could have anything to do with each other. It turns out, though, that there's a fundamental relationship between these two integrals. That is what the fundamental theorem is all about. To introduce the fundamental theorem of calculus, let's think about a specific example. Let's think of f of t as being your walking speed at time t. Then the indefinite integral, or antiderivative, is the function that gives your position at time t. Remember, the definite integral includes an arbitrary constant c. Just knowing your walking speed doesn't give enough information to pin down your exact position. But, when we know your initial position, or your position at time t equals zero, then we can determine the value of c. For the walking example, the definite integral is the total distance walked from time t equals a to time t equals b. In terms of this walking example, the fundamental theorem of calculus is just a statement of this obvious fact. The distance walked from time a to time b is just the change in position from time t equals a to t equals b. Or we could say that the distance walked is the final position, at time t equals b, minus the initial position, at time t equals a. In other words, the definite integral is the change in the indefinite integral. Let's make the example concrete with specifying your walking speed. Let's say your walking speed at time t, or f of t, is 1 plus 3t. If we let time be measured in hours and distance in kilometers, this means you started walking at 1 kilometer per hour and accelerated by 3 kilometers per hour every hour. We start by taking the indefinite integral, or antiderivative, of f to calculate your position at time t. Let x of t be your position at time t, then x satisfies the pure time differential equation dx dt equals 1 plus 3t. To calculate your position, we also need to specify where you start. We'll use the initial condition that you're at kilometer 5 when t equals 0. We calculate your position by taking the integral of f of t dt, that is, the integral of 1 plus 3t dt. The antiderivative is t plus 3 halves t squared, plus the obligatory constant c. We nail down the constant using your initial condition. Plugging in t equals 0, we calculate that x of 0 is c. The initial condition is that x of 0 is 5, so we conclude that c equals 5 x of t, your position at time t, is t plus 3 halves t squared plus 5. Turning to the definite integral, we want to compute the distance you traveled in the first two hours. This distance is the integral from 0 to 2 of f of t dt, or the integral from 0 to 2 of 
1 plus 3t dt. Recall that this integral is defined in terms of a limit of Riemann sums, but let's not calculate a Riemann sum. Instead, we'll use the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says the definite integral, or the distance walked, is the change in the indefinite integral, or your position. The distance you walked in the first two hours is just your position at time two, i.e. x of two, minus your position at time zero, i.e. x of zero. We just plug in numbers to calculate these values. Using the formula for x of t, we calculate that x of two is 13. x of zero is your initial condition, which is five. The difference is eight. You walked eight kilometers between time t equals zero and time t equals two. This calculation was quite a bit easier than using Riemann sums, but let's review how we would calculate the distance using Riemann sums to help us be grateful for the fundamental theorem of calculus and the work it saves us. Here is a plot of f of t in green, with your walking speed, or rate, starting at one kilometer per hour and increasing steadily to seven kilometers per hour after two hours. The graph shows a left-handed Riemann sum with five intervals, which estimates your speed at increasing steps from one kilometer per hour for the first interval to 5.8 kilometers per hour for the last interval. When we add up these five different rates, multiplied by the time interval width of 0.4 hours, we get an estimate of 6.8 kilometers. This estimate is a bit short of the real answer of eight kilometers for an obvious reason. We underestimated your speed in all intervals. We can also try a right-handed Riemann sum, estimating your speed in each interval by your final speed. In this case, when we compute the sum, we get 9.2 kilometers, which now overestimates the distance you walked. If we increase the number of intervals, we get a better answer, but with much more work. By the time we calculate 100 intervals, we are within 0.06 of the correct answer for both left and right Riemann sums. To actually get to eight kilometers, we'd have to increase the number of intervals to infinity. The moral of the story is that the fundamental theorem of calculus can save you a lot of work. If you can find the antiderivative of f of t, you don't need to compute Riemann sums. Just use the fundamental theorem of calculus instead. Okay, we have to admit, in general, that's a big if. Finding an antiderivative of a complicated function, f of t, could be difficult or even impossible. But let's not get discouraged about such sobering realities. We'll just focus on simple enough functions, f of t, so that we can compute the antiderivative and use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's take one more look at our calculation that determined you walked eight kilometers. To calculate a position in the first part, we needed the initial condition x of zero equals five. What role did this five play in the final answer of how far you walked? I highlighted where the five appeared in this calculation. The arbitrary constant c became five, so that the position x of t had five added at the end. However, when calculating the distance walked, notice how the five appears in both terms. It is added both to x of two and x of zero. Since we are computing the difference between these two terms, the five is both added and subtracted from our final answer. The fives cancel out. If, for example, we change the initial condition to x of zero equals seven, the indefinite integral x of t changes to add seven at the end but the definite integral doesn't change at all. It is still eight, as the sevens cancel each other out. The same thing is true if we use an initial condition of negative 11. The initial condition gets canceled out, leaving us eight for the distance walked. We could have even left the initial condition as the arbitrary constant c. When using the fundamental theorem of calculus to calculate a definite integral, the value of the arbitrary constant doesn't matter. We can ignore the constant c. Usually, for simplicity, we'll just let c be zero. We summarize the fundamental theorem of calculus as follows. Here I wrote it using the variable x rather than the variable t as that is more standard. Let's say you want to compute the definite integral, the integral from a to b for f of x dx. Then, according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, you just need to find any indefinite integral, 
or antiderivative of little f of x, which we'll call big f of x. The definite integral is just the difference in the indefinite integral. It is big F evaluated at the final point B minus big F evaluated at the initial point A. Since this F of B minus F of A occurs all the time when evaluating definite integrals, we introduce a shorthand notation. We write it like this, with a vertical bar and writing the limits of integration A and B just like we do for the integral. We still read it the same way, so we'd say that the definite integral of little f of x is big F of b minus big F of a. We close with one more example. Let's calculate a definite integral of an exponential. The integral from negative 1 to 2 of e to the 3x dx. The first step is to calculate the indefinite integral of e to the 3x. It's easier to calculate the antiderivative of 3 times the exponential because when we differentiate e to the 3x, a 3 will come down. So we multiply and divide by 3, writing the integral as 1 third of the integral of 3 times the exponential. The antiderivative of 3 times e to the 3x is simply e to the 3x, and the 1 third comes along for the ride. Since we are calculating the indefinite integral, we have to remember to add the arbitrary constant c. Wait a minute. We're trying to calculate a definite integral, so the arbitrary constant doesn't matter. It will cancel out in the end. We can choose any antiderivative, and let's choose the one where c goes away. We can set c to zero without any fear with definite integrals. The second step is to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now it's just a matter of plugging our expression for the antiderivative into the theorem. The integral from negative one to two of e to the three x is just the change in our antiderivative at the two endpoints. We have one-third e to the six minus one-third e to the negative three. If we want to calculate a decimal approximation, it's a good idea to use lots of decimals until we get the final answer, so rounding errors don't accumulate. I calculated the two terms with high precision, then rounded to five significant digits at the end to get the approximate answer of 134.46. In summary, the fundamental theorem of calculus allows us to avoid Riemann sums when calculating a definite integral, and instead calculate the change in the indefinite integral. As long as we can calculate the indefinite integral, or the antiderivative, it makes short work of calculating the definite integral.